Okay, welcome everyone for the fifth installment of our Know Your Local Government series. Um, thanks for all being here. Lots of familiar faces, so we have uh, lots of expertise now out in the crowd. And uh, today we have the school district of Turner, and um, we'll be presenting Brad Bowl. And Brad isn't here for his first time. He's been listening to the other presentations as well, so we appreciate um, uh, that involvement. I would like to thank State Line Community Foundation for the outstanding lunches that they sponsored so that um, we could, uh, throughout the whole series that we've had here. Um, again, this is the final one, but we will be looking at uh, how we can continue this, either with different um, topics or then as we come around into the next fall, uh, next year, whenever the time is needed to, to bring these the same uh, topics back up again. So um, with that, I would like to bring up Professor Laura Group from Bowling College and to give an introduction and an overview, and off we go. Great, thank you everyone. I guess I'm not as tall as, uh, as Nick here. Uh, so as, as Nick said, my name is Laura Groove, and I'm an associate professor of economics at Bowling College, and I've been working with emeritus professor of economics, uh, Jeff Adams, and also uh, Nick, to put together this series entitled Know Your Local Government. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on what the motivation for the series is. Um, and really it was, it came out of a, some conversations that I had with uh, Professor Adams um, and others in the community. And it was this concern that information about local government is not widely available and it's certainly not widely understood. So much of the news that we encounter today is absolutely national news and it's more difficult to find out about things that are happening in your own backyard. Um, and this is problematic for a few reasons. Um, and, and one that I find troubling is that research suggests that this decline in local news leads to higher levels of partisanship. Um, so, you know, ways in which we've become maybe more um, divisive, uh, the ways in which it's more difficult to talk to people that share a different perspective, all of that is worsened when it's just national news um, that is on our mind. Um, and then the other issue that I, in particular, am quite concerned about is that it certainly poses a challenge to advocates of open and transparent government, right? You have to know about government in order to be able to ask questions and um, kind of engage in, in debate and, and conversation. So um, this series then has the primary goal to educate residents of Beloit and dare I say makes the normative claim that we ought to take an active interest in our local government. So why should you know your local government? First, local government affects your day-to-day -day life and quality of life. So we know that decisions by the school board um, have an impact on the quality of education in our community. Decisions by the city have ramifications for policing and public safety, the state of the roads and intersections, and the quality of the park in your neighborhood. Second, and relatedly, it's easiest to affect change at a local level, and this is part of the reason why I enjoy living in a small town. Um, as a resident, you can meet with and make an appeal to your elected officials. You can provide feedback on an issue being discussed at a city council meeting. And in small cities and towns especially, it's easier to have your voice heard. And then third and finally, local government decisions um, impact your pocketbook. So if you are a property owner, you pay for local government through your property tax bill. Of course, as we have discovered over the last uh, several months, that local governments do receive revenue from uh, other sources, but your primary but property tax bills um, are an important source of revenue. So for this current series, we have invited the City of Beloit, Black Hawk Tech, uh, School District of Beloit, and Rock County. We're now kind of moving outside of that a bit uh, to talk about Turner School District. Um, if you are interested to learn more about the property tax bill in the City of Beloit, though, there is a, an informational document that Professor uh, Jeff Adams and I put together 
that explains kind of the language and the different figures that are presented on the property tax bill, how tax rates are calculated, um, and also explores what property taxes might be like if Beloit did not receive generous state aids. So again, that is available on the website, um, the Know Your Local Government page of from the Beloit Public Library website. So thank you again to State Line Community Foundation for providing lunch and of course to the Beloit Public Library for hosting. And thank you to Brad Bowl for making uh, yourself available today. And I look forward to asking a few questions, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's good to uh, focus on what's the information. We talked as a public education in some ways has become a political football. There's a lot of noise out there. We're going to talk today just simply about some facts to help you filter some of that noise you go through. There's a bunch of slides here I'm going to fly through. I'm not going to read all of them. If you have a question, please interrupt me and ask. I'll Surely entertain questions at the end. I want to talk about how the school district boy term is funded, what variables determine how much money we get, and then talk a little bit about Wisconsin school finance in general at the state level, and then what things look like currently in our individual school district. In order to do that, you have to know something about how schools in our state are financed, where we are now, how we got to where we are now, and then what the future looks like in terms of right now. Uh, we're trying to put together next year's budget, July 1 to June 30. All 421 school districts in our state are affected differently based on their equalized property value, where they are in terms of relative to other districts in the state, are they wealthier or poorer, simply in terms of equalized property value. They're also in a different position based on where they spend their dollars in terms of per pupil spending. We'll talk a little bit, some of that has been locked in since the early 90s. Uh, we're in budget season right now. Obviously, you've seen the governor's issued a proposal. Uh, some of the people on the other side of the aisle have reacted to that. They've scheduled the joint finance committee hearings. Uh, and there's one in Waukesha, one in the Dells, one way up north in the Monarch. I can't remember where the fourth one is. But our fiscal year begins July 1. I would say this year especially, it's doubtful that the state has passed a budget, approved a budget by July 1. Whether they have or not, they will not officially tell us how much revenue we get until October 15th, and that's the case every year. So we start our fiscal year July 1, spend money, and we don't really find out how much money we're going to have in revenue until several months later. State imposed revenue limits. The 1993-95 biennial budget is when uh, revenue limits came to begin. Initially, it was supposed to be for a five-year period. The very next budget, it was made permanent in the 95-97 state biennial budget. What that meant, because of what happened, is whatever school district spent in the 92-93 school year, and some school districts spent $100 more per student than another district, or $300 less than other districts, those amounts were locked in, because what you can spend is based on what you make in revenue, and that was, has been limited to the 92-93 school year. Up there is a picture of this uh, tube, so if you think about what the state revenue limit is, it's that plastic tube. So the state legislature can, on an annual basis, tell us whether that tube gets to be bigger or not. The total dollars we have to, available to spend are what's in that tube. For us, we're saying the red balls equal state equalization aid. The white balls equal local property tax. So what's happened in some biennial budgets is the state legislature has said, we're pouring X millions of dollars into public education. Well, that's true in one case. They gave us a bunch of equalization aid. But they said the per pupil revenue limit is it going to grow by zero dollars. So in effect, what they did is say this tube stays the same. That's how much money you got to spend. We're giving you more equalization aid. This ball no longer fits, which is what we got from property taxpayers. So all they've really done is provide local property tax relief. They haven't given schools a single new dollar to spend. And that's kind of been a trend in what happens in Wisconsin. So that picture just represents what that thing is there. But the change in the law then in the revenue limit capped how much we can raise in revenue, primarily from two sources, general state equalization aid and local property tax levy. The calculation is based on a three-year average student FTE, and those are membership students. It's actually fairly complicated in how the state counts students, and when districts talk about students, what they're talking about, you're talking about the students enrolled in your building, we got about 650, 1,650. Or you're talking about your resident membership, which for us is about 1,210. 
Those are different numbers and it affects how you get finance from the state. They finance based on resident membership, much different than butts and seats. Some of the resident members for which we're compensated are actually attending other school districts. The state imposed revenue limit for Turner is shown in blue, the state average in red. You can see that at one time uh, we were above the state average and we've fallen uh, lower and lower below the state average based on the revenue limit formula, which means we haven't kept track of the state average. Significant for our district, as most people don't understand, is that open enrollment revenue is outside of that cap. So there would be a, so you can see there for the 21-22 fiscal year, the current year we don't have final numbers on, but our net gain from open enrollment was $3.3 million roughly. So I have some pile of green balls here, which are additional dollars that we have to spend on programming in addition to what the state provides us from the revenue limit. For the current school year, that amount is 8224 for every regular education student we have. For special education students, about $5,000 higher. School districts need referendum approval to exceed the cap and raise additional revenue. So if I want to spend money in addition to what the state provides me in equalization aid property tax, our district has to go to referendum and ask the voters to be able to do that. Typically that's done for one of two reasons. Capital needs, issue debt, usually 20 year bonds for a specific purpose, build a new school, we just did that. Or in the second year, you're improving intermediate maintenance and repair. Sometimes you want to replace HVAC systems or boilers or parking lots or roof sections, big ticket items. Can't afford to do it on operating budget. And then reason two is for operational needs, which means our budget for the next year is projected to be a $2 million deficit. So in order to, how are we going to do that? Well, we can either cut $2 million worth of stuff or we can ask the voters to exceed the revenue limit by $2 million. And that's what a lot of districts have had to do. We'll talk later about recurring and non-recurring. If it's recurring, we're going to exceed by that $2 million forever. And other times, it's a three-year referendum to exceed. So in the first year, I want to exceed, and obviously inflation, so in the first year, I want to exceed by $2 million. Second year, I want to exceed by $3 million. The third year, I want to exceed by $4 million. So that would be a $9 million three-year referendum to exceed. At the end of that, that authority goes away, and I can ask for it again. Since January 1, 2000, 80% of school districts in our state have had a referendum for operational needs. Prior to that, it was almost only for capital needs building stuff. This is just open our own pupil count data to show you. So this is the third Friday in September of 2021. Our net gain was about 419 students. Remember I said our total enrollment is about 1650. And then January 23, the most recent pupil count, 422 net students. That hasn't really changed. And it won't really change because you approve how many spaces you have. And we basically have filled those spaces. So as uh, the senior class leaves, 4K or kindergarten class comes in, but in between, we approve every January spaces, and this year I think we approved two spaces in second grade, but we're basically full in terms of our capacity. So our net gain from open enrollment can't really grow much from where it's at right now. Remember that 422, take that times $8,200, and that's our revenue from open enrollment. Going back to the last biennial budget, so we're now in the 22-23 school year, so we're in year two of this biennial budget. This is Tremaine Clarity, the district administrator of Verona, had a quote that I was able to find. He actually spent a lot of time in Lloyd, some of you may be familiar with Tremaine, where he said, all students and staff across our state deserve better than zero. He's talking about, this thing needs to grow where we don't have money. The budget simply does not meet the needs of students and families. So let's talk about that. It's funding, how schools are funded in our state. And what the trend has been, so where we've been. From 2002 to 2020, Wisconsin had the largest decrease in per pupil spending of any state in the country. 2002, they were number 11, 2020, number 25. In 2002, 11.3% above the national average. By 2020, we had fallen 5 or 6, 5.6% below the national average, and that's in terms of per pupil spending. Adjusting for inflation for a slightly different time period, for, so from 2008 to 2018, that 10 year period. Across the country, increased by 5.4%. In Wisconsin, it decreased by 1.4%. So, spending on salaries for school district employees, this is another slightly different time period, 11 to 18. And then, obviously, 2011, because post at 10. So, as school district employees in Wisconsin are seeing reductions in their benefits, now paying for half of their retirement, um, increasing their contribution for health insurance. 
They were also getting salary increases that led the national average. So even had they gotten uh, salary increases that met the national average, their real uh, realized take-home pay would have decreased because they're paying more for their benefits. But across the country, salaries during that time increased by 13.1%. Wisconsin, they increased by slightly more than half that, 7.2%. Um, this is a little bit inside baseball, but 21-23, the state legislature, this, the COVID money, the ESSER dollars for pandemic release, relief, the state legislator, legislature tried to get kind of cute in how they wanted to deal with that. They had to submit a plan to the Department of Education. Wisconsin was the 50th of 50 states to have their plan approved. The initial plan uh, would have made us ineligible for $2.3 billion because they didn't spend the money on education. So basically what they did on a statewide level was this. They took $647 million and threw it in to state education financing, but just provided property tax relief because they didn't provide any increase in the revenue. So in a nutshell, they did the same thing. That bottom line there in red, we talked about a lot of increases that provide no new, new dollars for us to spend on teacher salaries, books, um, to pay, uh, to fix a parking lot. Anything that doesn't give us new dollars to spend on something, school aid and name only. Brett, did the COVID money come from, um, with regulation and, and rules from the federal government to the state that then imposed more rules on top of it, or how did that work? Yeah, clearly, so there's, there's uh, back to the noise. So people say, even legend, some of the members of our state legislature at times, that school districts can use this on anything. They can balance their budget with it. I'm simply here to tell you that's not true. You have to have your budget approved, then you have to submit reimbursements, and then you get that money back. But it can only be spent on certain things, and the, the big, there was ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. ESSER 3 was the biggest spot for district our size, about 1.2 million. Uh, I wanna say it was 20% of that had to be spent specifically to address learning loss during the pandemic, and that was based on what the DPI says address those things, a specific list of things you could spend it on. Got it? Now I'm looking at the per pupil amount per year. So it used to be that the per pupil amount increased by CPI every year. Prior to Act 10 and prior to Governor Walker, Governor Doyle's last biennial budget, they decoupled the per pupil amount from CPI. Since then, CPI has increased by the blue line. The per pupil revenue limit is increased by the orange line, which today in the current school year makes that difference $3,100. If they had not done that, if they'd simply said the per pupil amount will continue to grow by CPI, we today would have $3,100 more times 1,200 students. What would an additional $3,100 mean right now? First of all, it would mean fewer school, so those 80% of school districts had to go to operational referendum. Most of them had to go to an operational referendum because they don't have that money. They're going to operational referendum to make up that 3,100 per student difference in that time. Property tax bills would be lower had the per pupil amount kept up with uh, CPI or inflation. More school districts would be able to pay for some of those maintenance things out of their regular operational budget. What districts have been forced to do is keep cuts away from the classroom, defer long-term maintenance, um, until water's coming through the roof, we don't have to replace it. And when water is coming through the roof, we have to replace it, we can't afford to replace it, so we gotta go to referendum and say, you want us to fix the leaky roof, or you want us to let us keep leaking? That's kind of where districts are at. And the bottom one is not insignificant. School districts can afford to provide, provide employees with the compensation increases they deserve, which would be at least what inflation is. So now we're back to, you know, what we're talking about today is trying to ignore some of the noise and talk about what's actually going on. So this is a simple representation of that. That's a revenue limit worksheet for every school district. So you can find all of these on uh, Park Home Insurance website. There's a drop down list here for every school district and they populate for prior years. For the current year, you have to uh, make projections. So the only one you could pull out that would really be accurate, the school district play term would still be 21, 22. But I highlight this here where I circled the red, this zero, which is talking about the allowed per member change for 22, 23, which is telling you that the per pupil increase, that tube over there, I don't want to do that, that tube over there is not drawn <laughs> by anything in the current year. The rest of that you don't really care about now in the time. Thank you.
<laughs> but I'd be happy to when I'm done. So those per people amounts now are broken down here by year. Here's 2004, 2005. Here's this year. That red circle is the same red circle. That zero on the other sheet is carried over into the zero here. 15, 16, 0, 16, 17, 0, 17, 18, 0, 18, 19, 0, 21, 22, 0, 22, 23, 0. This obviously is Act 10. Prior to Act 10, we're growing by between $225, $275 per year. We're going up by CPI every year. Doyle's final budget. We decouple from CPI. He says $200 per year in year one, another $200 per year in year two. Act 10 comes and we say, Minus $538 per student. Then we get 50 bucks, 75 bucks, 75 bucks, zeros, and a couple of roughly 175 here. So if you think about that, the next slide is going to take these six numbers, seven numbers, add them up, this negative number, and then what we've gained since then, and see what that looks like. So in this period of time, from 2004 to 2011, we got about $1,700 per student to spend on new stuff. Then in a single year, it drops by 538 bucks per student. Since that time, in total, all the increases since then equals 554, which tells you from 12 to 23, we've just made up for this drop, so we're spending or getting in per people revenue about what we got in 2010, 2011. I'm not too sure how many private sector businesses are still surviving if they're making the same amount of money they made in 10 and 11. Here's the annual CPI increases. We know at the bottom that for 23-24, it's 8.0%. That's based on what CPI is certified by the Department of Revenue and the WERC, Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission, tells us that's the maximum percent you can bargain about for the upcoming year with represented employees, the teachers union for us. So you can see from back to 9-10 what these have increased by. By far, the current year, 2023, was the biggest. In as we said, 8.0% for the following year, starting July 1. So during that time, those per pupil amounts have increased by 7.26%, while inflation, this chart, if you take all those up, that total increase in inflation was 22.42%. So our per pupil revenues, this thing, what we have to spend, is about a third of what inflation has gone up. And people wonder why even that school districts have had to go to operational referenda to support their operation. It's not because they've been fiscally irresponsible, because all their costs are going up by 22%, their revenues are going up by 7%. I don't know a lot about business, but that doesn't seem sustainable. July 1, 2023, we said it's going to be 8%. So if we don't get, and, and this is why the 23 25 budget has been a huge thing, because we got zero in the last budget. They said, well, balance your budgets with COVID money. Some districts did that, some did not. That inflation, even though it did it, didn't know it was going to be 4.7 last year, certainly didn't know it was going to go to 8% this year. So we're saying, how do we possibly provide cost of living increases to employees when we don't know if we're getting any money from the state? And clearly at the bottom here, and this is important, Wisconsin School Funding Formula clearly creates winners and losers. And on this slot are some of the winners, and those would be large districts in Dane County, all of them who had referenda in November of 2022. I would say this, the most challenging referenda passed by 59.8%. Highest one, just under 70%. So this is back to the recurring and non-recurring thing, just to get it. So here's what Verona said. On November 2022 ballot, it said, do you give us permission to spend what's in this tube plus an additional $19 million every year forever? 70% said yes. This, the one in Wanakee is different now because it's 10 minutes. So what they probably, and I don't know how many years this was for, but if it was for three years, it would have been perhaps $2 million in year one, $4 million in year two, and $4 million in year three for a total of $10 million after three years. But the non-recurring thing is important. And if you pay attention at all and look at Parkview, Parkview had a three-year referendum. At the end, they got asked for it again. It got renewed for three years. Then they got asked for it again. They asked for it again in November. Voters said no. So now they got a $2 million deficit they got to make up. So they're going to ask again in April, will you allow us to exceed the revenue limit by $2 million, or do you really want us to cut $2 million in programs? And you don't do that without laying people off. That's the only way you cut that many dollars. 
So this would be a list of some of the winners. You can read the paper and figure out who some of the ones that are less. And there, I, a real good friend of mine that is no longer that worked in East Troy for 14 years. East Troy could not pass a referendum. Saying they passed one to build schools, could not pass an operating referendum. What do you do? How do you balance your budget if your community will not support a referendum? General Purpose Revenue, GPR. So this is the biggest fund that lawmakers have to give to schools. It's basically state income tax, state sales tax. But you can always look at GPR, general purpose revenue, where it's spent, where it's invested by the state. How much they give to schools, how much they give to municipalities, et cetera. How much they give to UW systems. So this is from 2011 to 2021. Back in 2011, 38% of general purpose revenue went to public schools. In 2021, 10 years later, that had dropped to 31%. So because of inflation, this may have been more dollars, but as a percent of general, general purpose revenue, it was 7% less. In 2022, and this I think is one of the three handouts, because I don't know on. The handout was either on tax burden or it was on the state budget surplus. But in any case, it's a Wisconsin Policy Forum publication from January 23 that said, Local taxes as a share of income have never been lower in at least 50 years, and they're saying probably ever because that's all they have data for is 50 years. And then state and federal taxes on family and business are also near historic lows. Then we get to this from um, the MacGyver Institute talking about there's some of the noise we hear is um, spending on instruction. Schools don't spend their money wisely only. 54% of what they spend is actually on instruction. First of all, these categories are based on how DPI tells us we got to code certain expenditures. So let's start with this, transportation. If we don't spend money on transportation, they don't get into the classroom. This is school lunch. Some districts have community service funds, we do not, but this is paying for school lunch program and school breakfast program. So now add those two together, we're just under 10%. Now facilities are the buildings they're in. So if we only want to spend money on instruction and having tents, that's one thing. We want buildings, and we got to spend that much a year. If you talk about administration, well, administrators don't teach kids. They don't affect academic achievement. That's, you know, I would say this. For school district employee we have a $20 million budget. How many private businesses with a $20 million budget just let the employees do what they want, don't have a CFO and a CEO managing how their strategic decisions are made? People staff support, that's the school nurse, the school psych. Um, paraprofessional educators, people that directly support what goes on in the classroom. And then operations other, those are things like custodians, cleaning, maintenance. I continue to have trouble with this. So when you hear somebody say, oh, and, and also they go back to 1718 to look at these numbers, we talk, when you see somebody talking about only this much is spent in the classroom, these other things are all supporting directly what's going on to support students. Transport them, feed them, provide uh, educational materials to them while they're in that classroom. So Wisconsin projected 2,000, so at the end of the 21-23 biennial budget, they look at what they project there to be at the end. They look at what they think they're gonna spend on, what they think they're taking in tax collections. The most recent um, estimates are that that budget surplus will grow to $7.1 billion. <laughs> So this also, so we have a big budget surplus for the state of Wisconsin, which we have, and this where it says hits 7.1 million. Both of those things talk about that being the highest state surplus in 50 years, in addition to the 50 year lowest tax burden in 50 years. So as biennial budget negotiations begin, Wisconsin's record budget surplus is independent of its budget stabilization fund or its rainy day fund, which is another 1.7 billion, which is also the highest it's been in state history. So if you take those two numbers together, you get $8.8 .8 billion. What the DPI budget request, which was decried by some in the state legislature as completely unrealistic, is less, much less than a third of that. So you can just talk, talk about what is available in revenue and what the DPI for K-12 education budget request was you can see it there. Since this is a different number because this is a different time period, but since 2016, so the other one was since 2016, 70% of those districts have gone to referendum with two thirds of those ballot measures passing. 
And those numbers do not include what happened in November of 2022 or April of 2023, which says that as times get tough and school districts are forced to go to local taxpayers, local taxpayers have expressed two thirds support for public education. Now we're just gonna drill down a little bit to school district of Lake Turner. So the school district of Lake Turner serves people who live in the city of Beloit, some people live in the town of Beloit, some people live in the town of Curry, and some people live in the town of Turtle. So those are the four municipalities that we serve. Those are the four municipalities that we levy property taxes to. So some people in all those municipalities, obviously the, the largest chunk is here, second largest chunk is here, hardly any from La Prairie and some from Turtle. So uh, I cheated a little bit and stole some stuff from the Mark's office here a couple weeks ago, but here's our organizational chart. The difference between ours and Mark's, I think, I think every employee of the school district of Turner is on this chart somewhere. So our board and board committees, the superintendent, director of teaching and learning, and director of technology. And then the building principals, director of pupil services, which is special education, director of business services, and then director of building and grounds. People always have kind of ask me what, so what business services mean, it's not just finance, but it's basically food service, transportation, and building and grounds, which means cleaning and maintaining our schools. But that's what our org chart looks like. Then our strategic plan, the 2025 strategic plan, basically maintain a whole student focus, develop public trust and communication, and attract and retain a high quality staff. And this is what everybody who does what Dr. McCarthy and I do right now is talking about. When we have openings, how do we get the best employees we can find? And more importantly, once we hire them, how do we keep them here? The vision statement talks about all students' life, college, and career ready. Um, I don't think it's any revelation anybody in this room that it's never been, there's never been less focus on going to a four-year college, ever. What are you doing for a career? What are you doing when you're done with high school? Are you going directly to the workforce? We work, are you already doing something while you're in high school with Blackhawk Tech? How do you become life, college, and career ready? Uh, I did these demographic uh, comparisons of the relevant players. So School District Beloit, School District Beloit Turner, the Lincoln Academy, and Rock County Christian. Obviously some difference in enrollments. Economically disadvantaged, basically that's measured by those that qualify for free and reduced lunch, students with disabilities, English language learners, the percent open enrollment or choice. So this obviously here, in some respects, all their students have chosen to be there. 80% of those Rock County Christian who attend there are there with a voucher. 33% of our students are OEN. 2.3% of the white students are OEN. So this, the 23-20-25 biennial budget is a state budget. Uh, we have a hard enough time looking one year ahead, so I'm only talking about the 23 24 budget process. It's impossible to know what we're going to do until we hear more from the state. And we've heard some things like the governor's proposal is unrealistic. Um, we need to provide more property tax relief, but we haven't, and we, we've heard a recognition that the legislature does need to invest in public schools, but we haven't heard much about how much. As I already said, our fiscal year starts July 1, and, right, and we know that uh, as we try to negotiate with groups or plan for how we're paying people after July 1. So all those are facing 8% inflation. Everything they pay for costs 8% more. At this point, we can't be certain that we can afford to increase our pay by 8% because we don't know if we're going to have revenue. Because if the state tells us this tube is going to be the same size again, there's no way we can provide 8% increases for staff. When I say staff, it's all 250 employees. 109 teachers, 8 administrators, and then oh, it's about 13 professional support, which would be school sites, school nurse, people like that, and then a whole bunch of hourly employees, custodians, cooks, paraprofessionals, and bus drivers. Speaking of which, maybe you'd like to get a CDL to talk to me when we're done. <laughs> Our state budget on Thursday, this is kind of the state's timeline, February 15th, the governor's budget address, March, April, joint finance, I and mean, this is just kind of typical what happens in our state. I'll be shocked if we know by July 1 what's happening. But we, we can't, I mean, we're, we can't even sit down and negotiate right now with a union because we're saying, right now we don't know that we're getting, when you do what I do, um, at this point in time, I assume we're getting zero. 
Because if I assume we're getting 5%, we get zero, I gotta cut stuff. It's way easier to add stuff than cut stuff. <laughs> so if I don't have any confidence I'm getting money, I'm not planning for money. So what do we spend our money on? I'm only talking about the general fund, right, where most of our dollars are spent. So this money is used to count for all financial transactions, uh, transactions relating to the district's current operations, so our general operating budget. There's all these other funds that school districts have. This, this one, special education, is significant. Second most significant to that, but there's also a debt service fund, which means if you pass a referendum and issue bonds, you pay for your principal and interest out of that. Capital projects fund is you, the money that you got when you sold those bonds, that's what you're spending to build stuff with. Food service fund is actually obviously school lunch. Custodial fund we don't have. Trust funds we don't have. Community service fund we don't have. We do some of this, but not through that fund. But those are all the funds, different funds that school districts can use. I'm only talking about this, the general fund, and that's by far the largest. So here's our ending fund balance, which some people love to talk about. So our June 30 end of year fund balance for 17, 18, 18, 19, 19 20, 20, 20, 21, and 21, 22, the most recently completed year. I'm only talking about fund 10, so I'm looking at this number. So one thing that happens for us is we do uh, a lot of summer projects. We replace parking lots, we replace roof sections, and those typically, on a given year, it's $400,000 in roof sections. It's been between $100,000 and $600,000 for parking lots. The good news is we're almost uh, done with roof sections, and once parking lots are done, we're not doing that every year. But when you do those things, you never know. You know you're doing them in the summer. Your fiscal year ends June 30th, so how we do in our district is this. If I know the parking lot's going to cost $600,000, $300,000 is budgeted to be done in June, $300,000 is budgeted to be done in July and August, and that's always wrong. We never know if it's good weather and it's all done by June 30, or it's crappy weather and it's all done after July 1. So the best way to do it is half and half, and that's why this would be, we didn't do much in the summer because we had larger fund balances, and the weather was better, so we were able to spend more. So that's why this bumps around. Every year when we approve our budget with the board, we project this ending 10 fund balance to be four and a half million dollars. You can see kind of how we've done. We missed it. Um, in a positive way by about 500000 in a negative way by about 350000 That's just based on weather and what percent of those capital projects get done in the summer before or after July 1. But I, I circled that because that's going to show up again here at the bottom. So at the end of the year, this is what, so first of all, people assume that means if you're ending the year with, with the, and I so. Full disclosure, I spent the last seven years of my teaching career in the basement of Beloit Memorial teaching business education, and I was the uh, negotiator for the Beloit Education Association, and I did the costings for the union. So here's what I did in those negotiations. I showed up and said, what was your fund balance? And then told them that was a bag of money in the business manager's office they could use to pay teachers. Well, that's not what it is. <laughs> here's what it is. So of that $4.2 million, we got that in cash. This is in taxes receivable from other governments, which is usually grant money that we've claimed but not been reimbursed for, and then some prepaid expenses for the following year, and then some liabilities. But that's what my, the point of this slide is that's our ending fund balance at the end of the year, but our cash is that two and a half million. So, this is really from the DPI website districts with appropriate fund balance can avoid short term borrowing, thereby avoiding interest costs. And for the last, prior to this year, last five years, nobody cared about that because interest rates were zero. I promise you, districts who have to cash flow borrow right now are worried because interest rates are up. Accumulate sufficient assets to make designated purchases or cover unforeseen expenditure needs. So that's the, if, if, a, if tomorrow, and this time of year doesn't matter because it's not that cold, but if tomorrow Powers calls me and tells me the boiler blew up and doesn't work, at this point, we're saying, well, it's not going to be that cold the rest of the year. We're not replacing it until next year. But if you have to replace it tomorrow, your only chance is to be able to do it from fund balance. You can't go to a referendum and say, next week in a bad boiler. It doesn't work like that. And then it impacts your bond rating. Your fund balance has a direct link to your bond rating. If your fund balance is stable or increasing, your bond rating is better. And when you do borrow funds, you pay a lower interest rate. 
This is con uh, fund balance is cash flow management. The most commonly asked question regarding fund balance is how large should it be? And this is from the DPI website where it says, perhaps the best answer would be an amount sufficient that short-term borrowing for cash flow could be avoided and would also allow the district to set aside sufficient assets to realize its longer range goals. Here's the other thing about fund balance is the, the DPI gives us our equalization aid in installments and it's in four installments. The last installment is 35% of what we get, and we get it the third Monday in June, and our fiscal year ends the end of June. So the only reason we're not cash flow borrowing is because we are also getting, have some open enrollment revenue to make that uh, survivable. The low points for us are in November, because we kind of spent all the property tax revenue, we're not gonna get it for another month. And in June, because we pay most of our, we cut all our checks for teachers at the end of the school year for June 22nd, as well as two payments in July and two payments in August. At the end of the year, they've completed all the work they're gonna do for us for that school year, so they get those five payments at the end of June. This is the 21-22 ending fund balance, that number I showed you, about four and a half million. On June 20th, 23, DPI is going to give us 3.5 million, which is equalization aid and a transfer from our own dollars, which says of that 4.5 million that we had on June 30th, 3.5 million we got 10 days before. So on June 19th, we had about $600,000. It doesn't give us a lot of cushion to deal with bad things, unexpected things. How, where do we get our money from in 21-22? And again, I want to talk about Fund 10. Half of it comes from the state in equalization aid. We just less than a quarter of it comes from open enrollment. Um, remember I said before that net number was 3.4. So we have 4.4 in revenue, but we pay out a million dollars for kids that open enroll out to other districts. So that's why those numbers are different. Property tax levy. So for 21-22, we took in twice as much money from open enrollment as we got from our local taxpayers. Federal aid, about a million bucks. Per pupil aid, which is uh, not dealing with this too, was it 855,000? And then other, which is uh, a big thing for us, that's a unique thing, one time thing. We <coughs> sold Townview in that year. That's what we sold it for. That's what we generated in money. So, oh, now I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> so that for us was a one, one time thing, that 2.37%. But that was our total revenue, 19.2 million dollars. Roughly, I would say 400. 400, okay. I just wanted to clarify because- I will, I can, I'll send you an email with exactly what it is, but- There, there was a lot of uh, discussion in last month's uh, presentation, or I guess it was this month because it was- 50, right. About yep. um, Lincoln Academy students that were no longer in the, um, enrolled in city public schools, but I just wanted to know what the figure was for open enrollment to Turner. So it seems like they are just about the same, about 400. The, yeah, I want to say their F, uh, the school district of Beloit's FTE in the prior year for Lincoln County was 354 point something. I think that drew by roughly 20 students when they added that other grade. So it's, yeah. it's somewhat less than 400 from school district Boyd to Lincoln Academy. For us. So per grade, it's two classes though, I think. Two, two sections, yep. Yep. Okay. But, but it's student FTE and how that counts okay. on the sheet versus, versus butts and seats. Yeah, the, the counting, yep. <clears throat> when uh, you've got 400 and some kids who are open enrolling, um, how does that affect your equalization aid? Does not. If they're, so they're outside. Correct. Yeah. So that's what, so if I go back to that revenue limit worksheet. And, and it's outside of the revenue limit. Correct. Do, they, do those yeah. kids leverage any other revenue besides their own 
Um, no, ex except so not direct. So, in basically, in order to have a better ability to qualify for additional Title I funds and a lot of other kinds of federal grants received through the state, you have to have a freedom reduced lunch rate about 40%. Sort of the fact that those 400 kids are gonna, well, they're, they're gonna factor into that 40%. That would be the only, I mean, that would be the only other, because they're part of our population, their, their data is gonna be part of that. Here's what I think is a, a, a puzzle for those of us kind of observing, is that you get paid $200 per kid. Yep. Open enrollment, but you spend per kid about 16,000. And in terms of a very aggressive, so, yeah. I think, uh, so he cares. Yeah, we don't. So, kind of, so, so first of all, we don't recruit. We don't send one postcard. We don't put up one building. Yep. No, no. I think we're being sarcastic. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scale issue here of some sort. It's a scale. Well, getting revenue of eighty-two hundred dollars, which would cost us sixteen thousand. So here's here's how I would say is that when we went to a referendum. I had a lot of people show up and say, exactly, you, you're spending sixteen thousand. That's not how much but you're spending sixteen thousand dollars on a student. Open enrollment's only bringing in eighty-two hundred. Every time you accept an open enrollment student, you're losing eight thousand dollars. And kind of eventually, you try to explain it to them, and smoke comes out of my ears, and I get frustrated. But that, that's just it. It goes back to this. Those, first of all, those dollars are outside of the cap, but it also goes back to that chart about instruction. Yeah, is if I have a hundred less students, I don't spend anything less on utilities. So fixed cost. Or if I have a hundred more students, I don't spend anything more on utilities. So yeah, it's fixed cost versus variable cost. That's what it is. No transportation costs. Right. Yeah, we don't transport non-resident students. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we did the study when we did our referendum to kind of counter that argument of what it was. And the actual average per pupil cost for a regular ed student is about $4,800. We have million dollar students that we're educating in special education. And when you balance those out, literally, students that will cost us over a million dollars in their time there because of the services that they get. Services that are $100,000 a year for one kid. So when you start balancing it out, you're still gonna have the same number of administrators. You're still gonna have the same number of buses because we don't bus anybody. There's a lot of fixed costs that are in the company. The only increase in cost for us truly was the additional section. We went from the wheel tracks to the wheel tracks. That's what we did. No, I, I, mean, I, I do actually know all that. <laughs> so, which, which is why there's, you a, know, there's a, an interesting problem when your enrollment is shrinking. Yes. Right. Correct. Yeah. So, that's what, so for us, that's why in January you have to approve open enrollment spaces. For us, in most grades, there's five sections, there's 24 students per grade, so our capacity is 120. So uh, seven years ago, if we only had 108 kids in that grade, we had 12 spaces to get to 120. So none of those kids increased our cost, well, except one of those, because we have to add a new staff to educate them. And now, uh, and on the prompt period, when the district is losing students, the costs don't go away either in the short run. Especially in a larger district, to make a good point, because in a larger district, you could lose 20 students. That could be one, two kids per building. It's not like you're cutting, right. making massive staff cuts because of that. So it's, it's, a, it's the, one of the most valuable points that you need to understand when you look at it as a percentage of the overall yeah. service of students. Even so, so then, so then given, um, given what you just said, other than the bricks and mortar and the space limitations, are there any 